Well, good morning, everyone, ladies, gentlemen. We are now starting this 10th session of the lecture series, Venezuelan Struggles. This would be the last session of 2020 of this lectures series. The second half will continue in 2021. This year, we've been focused on the analysis of the communal processes, the construction processes from social movements. We've analyzed the construction of the Chavism and the Bolivarian Revolution, and we've also analyzed the process of reconstruction of the Cumans of the rural areas, of the urban areas. We studied the feminist agenda the construction of Venezuela, the process for the construction of community services, the process for construction of uh, popular economies. We also had the chance to study how the dispute of democracy processes worked for electoral processes in Venezuela. And this allows us to have this last session of the year, which will be focused on Venezuela, and it's international politics, it's new geopolitics, which has to do with the drive of a multicentric and multipolar world. Before introducing the subject, I believe that it is very important to mention something, considering the previous session was centered in the Venezuelan electoral system. Last Sunday, as we said in previous sessions, we held the legislative elections in Venezuela. There was a turnout of about 31% of the Venezuelan population, where they chose 277 congressmen and women to the National Assembly by the Venezuelan legislative organ. And from that space, there's a configuration where 67.6% belong to the revolutionary forces, the Chavismo forces, and 17% approximately belongs to the main blockade of opposition in Venezuela. The rest of the distribution of the new National Assembly is composed by opposition parties and by other parties that support the Chavism, but that were not included in the large alliance blockages. It was a new election where there was a lot of mobilization, participation, and we must mention what it means to have elections amidst the difficulties generated by the imperialist blockade on Venezuela, and at the same time, considering the problems of the COVID in Venezuela. Those are some of the elements to be analyzed well, to be commented mainly prior to this session. Well, in order to begin today's session, before we introduce our panelists, I would like to ask Jade Shitsue to introduce the subject and then we will compliment. Okay, so I now give the floor to Mrs. Jade. Now, thank you, Hanan. As Michael Hassan, a Marxist geopolitical economist, clearly pointed out, U.S. politicians are waging a new Cold War against Russia, China, Iran, and oil exporting countries that the United States is seeking to isolate if cannot control their governments, central bank, and foreign diplomacy. How can we respond to this threat? We continue to reinforce the social consensus. Since 2011, we have conducted a research project on seven emerging countries. That is China, Turkey, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Venezuela, and South Africa. At the same time, we have organized seven South South forums on sustainability. Over hundreds of progressive scholars activists from the global South and the global north participate in the forums. The South-South consensus means that the global South people identify themselves with the principles of the free S, which refers to resource sovereignty, social 
social solidarity and human security. Together, we can build another better world, alternative to militarized financial globalization. A diversified, inclusive, and ecological sustainable civilization in which people and nature coexist harmoniously, thereby creating junior inclusive safety for all. What we have done is to follow our senior comrades, such as Sami Amin. He was a well known Marxist geopolitical economist and a committed activist for people internationalism. He defined delinking as a refusal to surrender to US Eurocentric globalization, and at the same time, an embrace of people agendas of development. He advocated the Bandung spirit for his whole life. In 1955, 29 countries from Africa and Asia participate the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, which represents a total population of, of 1.5 billion people, 54% of the world population. It aimed to promote self-determination, Afro-Asian economic and cultural cooperation, and to oppose colonialism or new colonialism by any nation. It paved the way for the creation of the non-aligned movement. On the other hand, in the last decade, in the Latin America, the pink tide disappeared and the rightists emerged However, along with the COVID-19 pandemic, there are good signs that the leftists have taken power again, such as the landslide victory of MAS in the Bolivian general election, and Venezuela's PSUV retaking control of National Assembly. In the forum, the guest speakers from Simon Bolivar Institute, International People's Assembly, and Alba movements will share their experience of how to develop geopolitics for a multi-centric and multipolar world. We sincerely hope that we will work together to promote the South-South consensus and people's internationalism in the new Cold War. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jade. Well, with Jade's intervention, certainly, before a world that is in dispute due to the imperial hegemony in a scenario where the Cold War and the confrontation between two models, we can see that today the North American imperialist hegemony during the last century or half century in Venezuela since 1999 with the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution, I would like to emphasize some elements in order to put you in context about this international geopolitics in Venezuela. One of the first international actions carried out by President Hugo Chavez, besides launching the alliance with Cuba in terms of a politics, economics, and culture, it's also the visit to China. As soon as Hugo Chavez was elected president, he traveled for the first time officially to the People's Republic of China, and they began a relationship that according to international analysis, turned Venezuela into the second most important strategic alliance in Latin America and in the Caribbean with China. Likewise, in the next years, in 2000 and 2001, if we study the milestones in terms of international politics, we can mention the oil tour that was started by Venezuela with Hugo Chavez from the OPEC summit they began an international discussion process to control the prices of oil and to make progress for the establishment of prices that were more fair for oil producing countries such as Venezuela. That year, 2000 and 2001, those two years were also marked by two geopolitical events. On one side, we had the Summit of the Americas in Quebec, where for the first time, Commander Hugo Chavez participated and proposed a criticism to the proposal of the area of free trade uh, 
or ALCA. And by this, a process of dispute was started for the impulse of the neoliberal model in a region. In parallel, in Caracas, they held the first summit against the social debt of peoples. An international summit where Venezuela was the headquarters, not only for the criticism to ALCA, but also the need for a model of society and integration project that is centered in the social debt and the need for the guarantee of rights to most of the populations. I mentioned those milestones uh, that took place during the first few years of the Bolivarian Revolution because they marked a process of construction that includes the criticism to the formal imperialistic policies, but it also began to build what we call a model of a multicentric and multipolar world. There, we want a world where there's no hegemonic. We want different axes of articulation with different uh, powers. I would have to mention that in a very brief uh, timeline throughout these years, in the year 2005, after the defeat, the symbolic and material defeat of the project of ALCA, of the free trade area for the Americas, the ABA was established. Then in 2008, UNASUR was established as a space for articulation or networking of the peoples of the South, mainly those that are not aligned to the United States in 2008 and 10 the select was formed which is a space for all countries of latin america and the caribbean without the united states so these are some milestones that took place during that stage and it was good for you to see the process of networking of this geopolitics international geopolitics of venezuela within that context we are now going to give the floor to our panelists today we will have carmen navas who is the general director of the Simon Bolivar Institute. She is also a politologist. She's a specialist in international affairs from the Universidad Central de Venezuela. And she's the executive director of the Simon Bolivar Institute for Peace and Solidarity Among People. He was also an advisor of external affairs of the dispatch of the presidency of Commander Hugo Chavez. So now we formally give the floor to Carmen. Welcome here. Well, Welcome. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. It is an honor for me to form part of this seminar, Venezuela in Struggles, Revolutionary Legacies, and well, it is a pleasure to participate in this 10th session and to share with you this topic that has to do with the geopolitics of Venezuela within the region. I would like to thank especially the organizers of the Global University for Sustainability, the Continental Platform of the Movements of ALBA, the Simon Bolivar Institute, the Research Center, the University of Lingnam, the Network of ALBA, the co-organizers of the seminars of the Regional Asiatic Coordination for New Alternatives and for the Green Ground Technological Institute. I would like to begin my participation by mentioning two thoughts, two lines of thoughts that have to do with the geopolitical vision. First of all, with the quote of Bolivar, which constitutes our flag regarding the geopolitics of Venezuela. We're going to talk about this historical fact, about his thoughts as such. Bolivar said in the letter of Jamaica, in the Charter of Jamaica of September 20, 
that according to his vision regarding the geopolitics of the vision, he wanted to see in America the largest nation in the world, not in extension and wealth, but in liberty and glory. Our geopolitics, even though it was born from our geopolitical position, and as the theory says, even though we are a physical part of the geography of territoriality, it also has some elements or ideas and philosophic concessions that will mark us all throughout our history. And we are also going to see this reflected in the reasoning, in the thought, and in the strategic geopolitics that was developed by Hugo Chavez and which is the starting point for the Bolivarian Revolution. Always considering the Bolivarian reasoning and thought. Taking into account some updates evidently that have to do with this area. Commander Chavez said that the future of the multipolar world resides on us, on the networking of the majoritary peoples of the planet to defend ourselves of colonialism and to reach the equilibrium neutralized by imperialism and arrogance. With these two lines of thoughts, we in Venezuela, it's important to point out that there has always been one vision of this geopolitics that has been marked by several milestones that it is important for you to know, and which are going to represent the huge paradigm and geopolitical doctrine of Venezuela. As you all know, and it is important to start from here, otherwise we won't have the geopolitical view very clear. Venezuela was part of the colonies of the Spanish uh, empire. And from its beginning, its geographical position was fundamental for the role or the process of Venezuela in the process of independence of the ancient Spanish colonies. Then in the 20th century and since uh, the uh, start of the Bolivarian Revolution, the role was to build a multicentric and multipolar world. From its beginning as a colony and due to its geographic position in this institutionality of the Spanish reign, Venezuela was some kind of a hinge, so as to call it, they unified two important poles in our American continent. In the South, it represents a hinge between the Southern section of America and the Northern section of America. Venezuela is a port within the concession of the administration of the Spanish reign. If that wasn't the case, it wouldn't have the importance or it wouldn't be the center that represents the union between the colonies and the metropolis, which would be the by reign of La Plata, the by reign of Peru, the New Granite, etc. Venezuela is within the Spanish administration, a general captainship, a general captainship that had uh, economical importance and relevance. But if we could make a comparison with the current situation, at that time, Venezuela was a military base of the Spanish imperialism in the region. Of course, this is important and it's crucial to understand many of the things that we have experienced throughout the history of Venezuela. This situation of general captainship, even though it did have a relevant view, it allowed certain freedoms to Venezuela. 
these freedoms had to do with the fact that they would arrive in Venezuela because it was an important maritime port. There were many ideas. From the beginning, Venezuela received evidently, as in many parts of the world, the ideas of the illustration. But in Venezuela, they did an important uh, termination. We took this as a milestone to determine or to help determine how the Venezuelan processors were going to use this idea of the illustration based on two important milestones for us, which were two important historical uh, figures such as Francisco de Miranda and Simón Bolívar. Looking beyond ourselves, and this will always be a Venezuelan milestone. With Francisco de, Mirando, de Miranda, who left Venezuela early and started to have a contact with the revolutions and with the liberating processes and independent processes and the huge wars of the world. There is an important first step, which has to do with the idea of the great Colombia. With Miranda, we started to see the need of establishing a pole or a geopolitical referring aspect in the, con in the American continent, understanding several elements, both from the geographical point of view, from the culture point of view, from a language point of view. And uh, they provided some kind of homogeneity and important cultural force that could help determine Venezuela as a geopolitical pole that was of great relevance. The territoriality of the colonies and uh, mainly the free colonies that are independent for Francisco de Miranda in the beginning and then for Bolivar were a fundamental point to consider that we had the force to build an important geopolitical pole. For Bolivar, early on, even though Venezuela had not uh, achieved its freedom, I'm talking about different topics, uh, but it's just to give you a general idea. In 1891, we finished the war of independence of Venezuela in the Battle of, Cara Battle of Carabobo. We finished consolidating what was called the Republic of Venezuela, which was free of the Spanish imperialism. After that, Bolivar left for the new Grenade through the Andes and looked for in an attempt to help the independization of other Spaniard colonies, such as Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, and uh, the creation of Bolivia. This is very important for us because Bolivar understood that there wasn't freedom with just one country. I mean, there isn't freedom or independence if we were just one independent republic and the rest were under the yoke of the Spanish colony. We understand the Bolivarian view or the position of Bolivar of creating or conforming this huge republic considering or taking into account the great Colombia of Miranda. Because as I said at the beginning, it was the idea or the desire to have a huge American nation that uh, would give a counterweight. And in that case, we would have to take into account the fundamental geopolitical principle of our new republic both of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, as well as the beginning with Bolivar. So as I was mentioning before, Bolivar, after 
the non-completion of the freedom of Venezuela headed for the continent. But we're not talking only about the political freedom. I'm talking about the concession as a foundation. And he proposed, once the freedoms were generated, the confirmation of the Congress. And he called for this Congress. That is how the universe equilibrium doctrine began for us. And today we can consider fundamental regarding terms of multipolarity that it is not only important to, to take into account the territorial heart, but also to form a geopolitical center with multiple forces with multiple centers that will allow to guarantee peace and stability of the nations in the world. So that would be the huge Bolivarian concession of geopolitics that support us. And that will be also fundamental to give a counterbalance to what was started and which was the current U.S. imperialism to the Bolivarian concession of the multipolar world and multicentric world and the equilibrium of the universe, we have a counterposition of what has been mentioned here, which is the Monroe Doctrine. So we are in this region with two great visions, two great views of the geopolitics, the Monroe policy, we have called it 2.0 because it has been strengthened, not only from its ideological conception point of view or philosophical point of view in the past, but also with the great technological and military resources that we have nowadays. And the Bolivarian doctrine that has to do with the equilibrium of universe, the multipolarity, the freedom of the peoples, and the need of the constitution of a world where everyone is equal and where there is respect to national sovereignty. In the 21st century, to understand the current uh, geopolitical role of Venezuela, we have to start with two aspects. Venezuela remains the hinge. We have not changed our geographical location. We are the core between North and South America. And uh, we are open to the, the Caribbean Sea, the Atlantic. Uh, ocean and we are the channel of communication between the two regions however since we gain an important position when we started to exploit oil resources at the beginning of the last century it is going to be a determining factor for our Republican history. We become one of the main oil producing nations in the world with the proven reserves. And a fundamental and privileged geographical location. The main oil supplier at that time a secure oil supplier. This geopolitical aspect is going to be of the essence to understand the role the Bolivarian Revolution led by Hugo Chavez starts to act and change the idea of uh, in the Venezuela as a secure provider of oil to the US. In 1999, this is another historic jump. We cannot forget that Venezuela was also always considered stable, safe, 
nation for the U.S. interest in the region. It was part of the backyard in the region. And it was unquestionable that Venezuela was a safe country in the backyard of the United States. And the pivot of stability in the region for more than 100 years. Now, with Chavez in 1999, we observe a new geopolitical relation starts to rise between the promoters of the Monroe Doctrine and Venezuela, going back to the Bolivarian approach of the equilibrium of the universe and geopolitics as a new element within international relations or rather international relations based on the geopolitic, geopolitics of oil in order to give this region a new conception, a new conception of a pole of power this is not a direct result. It's not that when Chavez uh, uh, is elected, everything changed. No, there are other elements in the region that contribute to this uh, change. Hernan already raised this. However, we need to stress that when Chavez arrives in 1999, her first, for her, his first visit as uh, head of state, is to China. His first trip is to visit China plus other Asian nations. The first of six visits, which are which is very important because these are not mere visits. They carry the idea of uh, change to find new markets to diversify our diversify our suppliers of uh, manufactured goods but also to become a center a host for those countries here in latin america and this is key to understand the imperial offensive against Venezuela. Since 1999, Venezuela becomes the open gate to the arrival of other powers in the region. And this, of course, threatens the Monroe Doctrine 2.0, the backyard uh, approach, and the, and the stability of the US empire. So, for the first time since the beginning of the exploitation of oil in Venezuela, the US understands that Venezuela is no longer the secure oil supplier. In 1998, the US through its Secretary of Energy made a statement indicated that the US has saved oil for 100 years and that safe oil for 100 years does not come from Texas or the Middle East. It comes from the Venezuelan reserves. Namely, the Venezuelan reserves have been already incorporated to the US reserves. And this is essential to understand this idea of uh, Commander Chavez to diversify the Venezuelan oil market threatens the US conception of it, its ability or its uh, secure oil policy. So not only Venezuela, starts to be open to other markets in order to sell its oil, 
but also for the first time breaks the logic of being the safe consumer of manufactured goods from the US. in order to industrialize our raw material, namely oil. So it is not only a matter of a trade relation, it is also a matter of geography, economy, culture, cultural aspect, a new colonization. Chavez broke that geopolitical logic Geopolitics is not only geography, especially in the case of Venezuela. Geography is, uh, is important in Venezuela, but since 1914, our, our cultural conception, uh, conception, our consumption is to, based on the, the sale of oil to the US. So with Chavez, we started to sell oil directly to other markets in India, China, but not only in Asia. We also started to establish other trade cooperation relations and complementarity in our own continent. And this is Important because because hundred years Venezuela didn't have a relationship with regional powers such as Brazil, potential consumers in Argentina. Our uh, commercial ties were very timid with the Caribbean, even though we are a Caribbean nation. It should have been a very strong, a stronger relation, but it didn't happen because our relation was to sell oil to the U.S. and purchase everything from the U.S. So with Chavez, again, after the visit paid to Asia, he started fresh relations with uh, Brazil, first with Cardozo, And uh, Venezuela helped Venezuela to complete the refining process with NAFTA from Brazil, vessels com coming from Brazil, breaking the blockade. So even though this was a very specific uh, situation during the oil strike in 2002, Venezuela started fresh relations with Brazil. And then Venezuela started to invest in the refinery in the northeast of Brazil. So with Chavez, the unilateral relation with uh, the US changes. And even though he continues selling oil to the US, he starts to diversify our industry and our markets. We do not consider this to be a threat. We still are a secure provider to the US, but from the Monroe Doctrine, this, is, uh, this poses a threat to their stability to their geopolitical role and to the idea of a secure backyard. So the Venezuelan geopolitical approach, seeing that not only it's a matter of uh, wealth and territory, Venezuela start, starts using oil for international policy in order to encourage another 
aspect of our geopolitics, namely the South South cooperation, complementarity, unity and friendship among the peoples, and the Venezuelan oil. That was already being traded in the Caribbean is used now in this new this new approach to help peoples to get independent, to strengthen complementarity, solidarity among the peoples. And we in San Jose Accord, we then created Petrocarib. The Venezuelan oil, therefore, uh, that was just merchandise in the US and the merchandise in Asia becomes a tool to help uh, the independence and complementarity with other nations. It is therefore the Bolivarian conception of Venezuela to leave its borders, not to colonize or to subject other peoples, but rather to help their independence, to assist in the construction of a peripura world multi-centric world, the need to achieve the equilibrium of the universe. And in this fashion, we try to elicit the idea of geopolitics, the counterbalance among nations. With Bolivar and Chavez, we then understand that we need to have institutions helping our geographic position be strengthened as a region. Bolivar with the Aficionic Congress of Panama, And uh, with the defeat of the Bolivarian uh, doctrine for 100 years, there is a new need to create a regional bloc. Based on the, the territorial wealth, the cultural wealth, but also there is the idea that we need to create several poles of power with various visions not only the economic perspective, and our colleague coming after me will elaborate on this, the ideological aspect, the market unity, economic unity, to have a cultural strengthening, to pass laws, adopt regional proposals of uh, diversity and so on. And all this goes back to Bolivar, that uh, the wealth of the nations is not the territory, but also the culture and the idea of uh, liberty. So this geopolitical role of, of Venezuela is strengthened as soon as the uh, progressive governments are elected in the region with similar ideas, also Bolivarian ideas. We see the, the victory of Ecuador, Evo in Bolivia, Brazil under Lula and Dilma. And this is fundamental. If in 1826, when the Aficionic Congress was convened, if we had the Portuguese empire, namely Brazil, we are certain that 
it's difficult to change the past. But uh, I think with a different situation, we would have been created in the region because the fact that we didn't have at that time a giant country such as Brazil with the territorial wealth, population and natural resources, helping to foster these uh, new power proposed by a Bolivar, at that time it, it, we didn't have that, but with Chavez we did because we had uh, Lula, Dilma, Evo and Correa, and then Lugo in Paraguay, and progressive uh, governments elsewhere. Nationalists in the Caribbean, and with governments that uh, were not progressive, but in agreement with the realities of their own countries. So they understood it was necessary to build a Latin American reality that could uh, support us in our negotiations in the uh, engagement with other powers in the world. To understand this is important if we want to understand Chavez's vision of Venezuela. And, and uh, there is a letter signed with uh, Uruguay that will be the seat of UNASUR the accord with Tabare Lula that we lay ground, the groundwork of CELAC. And one of the last actions of uh, Chavez was precisely to create CELAC despite his advanced uh, disease and the, the strong attacks already launched by the US and with the right wing Uribe and uh, Mexico under the pre and the pan that were not the allies, but they understood the need to have a strong region from Mexico to Argentina. This is the Venezuelan geopolitical vision that uh, at a given moment in time found circumstantial allies, not ideological allies, but allies that are clear about the geopolitical uh, needs of the region. This is essential because this gives rise to various assumptions Venezuela now becomes a troubling actor in the region, according to the US. Venezuela not only has brought new commercial partners to the region, but also Venezuela has gave rise to other and different ideas the, the, different from the hegemony of the US, Venezuela is attracting enemy powers according to the doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine, namely China, Russia, Venezuela is opening commercial opportunities to different, uh, uh, to different markets and much more attractive markets than the US market. Venezuela broke with the, the logic of the secure market and uh, that 
is going to be the triggering factor in the 21st century. With the arrival of Chavez, the, the um, geopolitical vision of the region changed completely. With the Bolivarian Revolution, the US considers that its geopolitical position is threatened in the region. And with the Bolivarian Revolution, there is a new relation between our region and the rest of the world. So many thought that it was important to proceed to a geopolitical reconfiguring of the region. And with the passing of uh, Commander Chavez in 2012, well, they thought that Venezuela will then will be back to the herd. It will become a secure backyard country. And he, Venezuela will restore the traditional relations with the US. And we'll go back to the role as pivot as a medium-sized power to preserve the geopolitical stability of the region. However, that was not the case. Once Chavez dead, Maduro is sworn in, the geopolitical relations have changed, the Venezuelan strength is no longer the same because the Venezuelan oil is not as important to the US since they found new ways to find oil in the US with the, uh, the shale gas and Canada as a supplier to replace Venezuela. And also they try to destroy the Venezuelan oil industry. And uh, given the loss of the governments in Brazil, Argentina for a while, destroying the Venezuelan capacity to supply oil to Petrocaribe and trying to defeat the international political profile of Venezuela. So we understand the role, the geopolitical role of Venezuela in Venezuela in 18th century, in the 20th century, and why Venezuela today has to be defeated in order to consolidate again the safe backyard doctrine, the Monroe doctrine of America for the Americans, and to expel extraterritorial powers that with Venezuela have, re, have uh, succeeded in having a foothold in the region, either through military cooperation with Russia, commercial relations with China, with other European countries, the idea of uh, sovereign, independent, and free nations in the Caribbean, the idea that uh, the geopolitical specific weight is not decisive for nations to be considered of first or second category but also the size of the territories and populations are relative when you have an idea of sovereignty, freedom, the sovereign use of your resources, and the need especially to be in a region with a, a very unique approach 
of your territory and a unique approach, political approach, contrary to the hegemon of your region. So, in closing, so in closing, I would like to say that the coming years are going to be a threat, a, a, a challenge. First, the challenge to preserve our political and geopolitical role, our own geopolitical role, and uh, fostering the idea of a strong continent, united, to rescue the Bolivarian idea, the Miranda idea, and the Chavista idea, that nations are not rich only because of their territory or their population or mineral resources, but also they are rich because of the liberty, the ideas they have on the sovereignty, on independence, the assistance they can provide to other continents. The idea of cooperation. Those are elements that we will continue defending. And uh, the purpose of this conference is to include another element in the geopolitical relations, not only states, with the governments and institutions, but also the states with the peoples. And it's the relation among the peoples that could help us to establish a uh, better adapted to geopolitical ideas, uh, adapted to the new times. So it's not only the uh, geopolitical or the military power of the states or the stable governments, what, what truly matters. Or countries with uh, fine infrastructure, but uh, also what's also important is important uh, link among the peoples. So this is our geopolitical approach as uh, the drivers of a new sovereign position of uh, the people and uh, the people's power as, as one force of these nations. So well, I hope I have complied with my task with the idea. I hope that you have understood and that you have enjoyed the presentation. Undoubtedly, of course. And well, you accumulated lots of questions and we will read the questions in the end. In the end, we're going to have a second round of debate. From the streaming, from the broadcast in China, we have 2,108 people who are following us. And uh, through the Zoom, there are 41 people following us. So in order not to extend myself, I will immediately give the floor to our next panelist. Remember that the topic today is centered on the analysis of the role of Venezuela and its geopolitics for the promotion of a multicentric and multipolar world. Carmen provided us a general view a general overview of the doctrine from a historical point of view, from the Bolivarian point of view. He talked about the specification of that model in the practice. Next, we will have the chance to talk to Ana Maldonado, who is a militant of the Francisco de Miranda Front. She's a, also a sociologist of the Central University of Venezuela 
Anna is going to talk not only about the construction from the Bolivarian point of view as a government, but the way that doctrine has been networking with the popular and social forces from a worldwide point of view. So now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you in this seminar, in this course, Venezuela in Struggle. I would like to thank the professors. We had the pleasure and the honor to receive here in our motherland the professors from the Lingdang University and uh, Jade and all the other professors who we had the pleasure and the honor to receive here in our motherland in January this year. We would like to extend our greetings. You were, it's excellent for me to participate in this course. I would like to thank also Hernan Vargas and the organizers for the opportunity and also Professor Kian Chi Lao. It's a pleasure for me to see you here with us. The task that has been assigned to me today is to talk to you about the organic work for the construction in the International People's Assembly. This task implies past of what Carmen, part of what Carmen Navas talked to us. It has to do with that construction, with that historical objective that has been developed in the past that connect to those ideas and those libertarian roots, independent roots that come from the past and that connect us to the future. So in that future, we are networking and we are linking with different spaces of organic articulation while the neoliberal hegemony is uh, more focused and interweaves a neo-fascist international policy and imperialistic policy with a series of uh, references. And I can mention one of them, Steve Bannon, with his uh, network of neo-fascist international network. He recommends peoples and he recommends the left wing and he not only recommends it, but he specifies it based on a series of measures from an ideological plane and from a political plane. He recommends fragmentation. And the idea that we cannot build unity based on diversity. So this is a political, political, ideological, economical, and cultural struggle. And the International People's Assembly that has been formed for three years in an organic manner and that has been following and complying with the needs and the desires of the peoples and their fights has taken very seriously that challenge of uh, establishing an organic network in a collective and democratic manner to other organizations, other movements and other parties that have been articulating with the International People's Assembly. This platform, this articulation or this union of popular organizations, which by the way, I am sure that Hernan will talk about during the closing area, is based on history, which Carmen mentioned because evidently the Monroe Doctrine that states that the South Global was going to be the backyard for the empire and the US hegemony generated at that moment, the idea of establishing not only one agreement, the FTAA, 
the free trade area of the Americas. That was not just an agreement. They wanted to establish an area for the eviction, for intervention, for violence against our territories to exterminate us as independent and sovereign peoples and to extract from us labor force, resources, and endless or countless human and material resources that the U.S. empire and capitalism needs to attack the organic crisis because in the end we are talking about a context crisis, an organic crisis of capitalism. So the F, this FTAA in Latin America was defeated. It was not totally eliminated. However, it was defeated as a domination or domain point of view. So this gave rise to the need of fighting in an organic manner in order to build an alternative, to build a union. And uh, the International People's Assembly has that goal. We must build ourselves as anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, anti-colonialism, anti-patriarchal and anti-racist movement. I have a minimum presentation. It is a graphical presentation. Hernan sent it to you. So if we could share that presentation with you, Jade has it. So it is a graphic presentation, but I think it will be useful. For us to have it, an organized set of ideas regarding the goals of the International People's Assembly. As I said before, let's go to the next slide. This idea has led us to hold different meetings between March 2017 and so far as of today, that meeting was held in June. Of 2018. And for the first time, not only the different organizations that were part of the movement participated, but also the foreign ministry office was invited. So we began a process where we established our needs. We needed this effort of anti-colonialism, anti-racism. We had to organize ourselves in a collective and democratic manner so as to establish a foundational meeting. We can now go to the next slide, please. So we had a foundational meeting, but we didn't want to have just one meeting. We want this to be the result of an organic networking process. Besides, I wanted to mention that our friend, our intellectual North American friend, Noam Chomsky, has shown this context as internationalism or extinction. The International People's Assembly was registered uh, in the fight for internationalism and for all the reasons that Carmen mentioned, because we have historical reasons, we have deep reasons uh, for independence and freedom, for the international construction, militant construction for that independence and that liberty. It also reminds us that even though Noam Chomsky worked specifically based on another networking where we also, that we also supported, we also supported him and he, we wanted his success and it had to do with the progressive internationalist movement. We're talking about an organic uh, capitalism 
that is in a phase of melting or liquefaction, but that Commander Chavez always reminded us that this phase could be even more atrocious the phase that came after this melting or liquefaction of capitalism could be worse because all the classical personalities that accompanied us from Carlos Marx up to Mao, Carlos Marx, for example, said that capitalism was not going to die due to a natural death as a product of its contradiction, that we had to work in order to build organic subjects for the union and integration of our struggles. And our comrade Mao always reminded us that a revolution is not made, it is organized based on the international plane with a networking of movements, organizations, parties, peoples, based on the unity of actions on an action plan in international struggles. That has been the fundamental work of the International People's Assembly. This must be an organic process. It is not an eventual movement. It's not a matter of holding an international event and to propose very good ideas, but then not to have good results. We have worked the other way around. In order to generate organic results, we must have a unification of criteria and of practices, collective uh, calls, different campaigns, for struggles, and that is why it is very important for us to be in this lecture series that has made emphasis on the flags that people are rising for our definite and total independence. If you want, we can now go to the next slide. The idea of having one first meeting of the International People's Assembly came about and was celebrated, celebrated, or was supposed to be celebrated on the first quarter of last year. But within that context of that first quarter, we were particularly sieged, specifically the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And uh, the International People's Assembly, in a very solidary manner, proposed that instead of holding the or inviting the 1,500 delegates that we wanted to invite for the foundational assembly, they proposed a solidarity chapter with the revolutionary, with the Bolivarian revolution. So last year we held a first meeting of the International People's Assembly in solidarity with the Bolivarian revolution. At that moment, we started a campaign, or there was a campaign by the United States with the blockade against Venezuela. Especially, they made a, a constitutional aberration, which is the punishment of the president and also the interim president of Venezuela, which are not mentioned in the introduction. And that is why I spoke about the need of calling for the renewal, the recovery of the parliamentarian space, of the space in the National Assembly, because this uh, was kidnapped by this deputy. He acted as a puppet of the United States to produce an uh, interim presidency that was out of order. So the International People's Assembly proposed to meet in Caracas in order to work in a solidary manner so as to diagnose the actions of our common enemies, the capitalism and if its imperialist way to act for foreign capital and transnational companies. 
we have to characterize that type of capitalism and imperialism that are acting nowadays, where there's a high concentration of capital, where there is some sort of archipelago of multinational corporations in our territories. And by doing that diagnose, we must agree on principles for that political platform that should unite us and that should uh, make us meet. So as to agree on a unitary action plan against our enemies. That networking and that struggle must have important foundations that we are going to see later. Later on, we're going to talk about this, not only to articulate ourselves, but also to simultaneously form and train ourselves to generate communication platforms and to articulate different campaigns. So the fourth goal of the International People's Assembly is to celebrate our unification and to promote our fights. Next, we can go to the other slide. In that campaign, and certainly Hernan will talk more about this because Alba has uh, a category which I want to share with you, which is the most important power. Which is the most important power in Venezuela? The people's power, the communes as a pathway for the construction of socialism. And which is the most important power for our articulations within the regional and international environment? Well, the ALBA. So ALBA is like the embryo of our continental alliance in view of the International People's Assembly. Regarding the defeat of Alca, Commander Chavez had a set of organizations while he was in power as part of the peoples that were fighting. They proposed the, the World Social Forum in the years of the hegemony. In 2009, they proposed the Charter of the Social Movement of the Americas, the Charter of Belen, which was also a call that called the popular movement of the continent to articulate the fights and the popular organization of the entire region. Likewise, later on in 2015, a very important conference was held, which was driven by the rural movement of Brazil. It was a conference called Dilemmas of the Humanity. It was held in Sao Paulo in June 2015. And uh, there were 200 participants coming from the five continents. Basically, we can say that the International People's Assembly started to gain force from an international standpoint to organize continental meetings, regional meetings, in the region of Maghreb and in the North Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, in Europe, especially the same way they talked about dilemmas of humanities here in Latin America. In Africa, they also hold the conferences of Pan-Africanism in order to unite more efforts so as to have a program de unification. This is not just one unification of attending a conference and that's it, no. We need a programmatic unification. And by the way, I would like to quote a very interesting comrade that does not form part of this alliance, 
but is a person who we are convincing for her to accompany us. She's a philosopher, philologist from Belgium. Her name is Chantal Buffet. We want her to write Oh, she wrote with Ernesto Lacroix in 1984, a book called Hegemony and Socialist Strategy. She said that the articulation of the 90s, the World Social Forum and other movements had a difficulty because they talked very well about the goals of the networking, but then they did not build from a national standpoint and from a local point standpoint and the sectorial standpoint, they did not build options that could actually build organic solutions for each one of our countries. So it is very important that these efforts of the International People's Assembly, it is important for you to know that they have the intention to build this articulation in each one of our communities, in our organizations, in our movements. We must unite with our diversities for these four goals that I mentioned before. So in the African continent, since the year 2016, we are holding conferences for Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism Today that was held in 2016 in Lusaka, then in 2017 in Tunisia, in 2018 it was held in Ghana, and it has gathered more than 30 countries from Africa in general, but specifically in the South Saharan Africa. Also in the region in the northern area of Africa, in the Arabic region, in the area of Maghreb. They have been holding regional meetings, especially in Tunisia, in order to gather militants, activists of those countries in the southeast of Asia also. They've held regional meetings, such as the encounter of popular movements of Asia. That is why it is very important that this course invites many organizations and students and militants, intellectuals, people from the academia, from China and from Southeast Asia, so as to strengthen the articulation within the Asian region. In Europe, there have been regional meetings. In 2018, they held a meeting in Barcelona with the presence of 25 countries, 68 popular movements. The sectorial area has gained forward. Europe is a region that must be conquered. In the first slide, I talked about the Corona shock because this year, those assumptions and those principles of the neoliberal hegemony of the hyper-fragmentation, of the hyper-atomization of the subjects should generate a recovery of diversity, but of the programmatic unity as well. We must unite something that is not antagonic, but that uh, has been presented as antagonic. And it is especially in Europe where there has been the seed of the hyperfragmentation Everyone has to go through their path and there's no possibility for generating a unification. And that is what the Corona shock is. It's like a minimum state and the same thing happens in Argentina. After four years of management of Mauricio Macri as a neoliberal president amongst his achievements, 
achievement, he eliminated the Ministry of Health. But now you can see the consequences of that minimum state that did not allow to build or to attack or attend the needs of the people in the most basic aspects of mankind. Lastly, in the American continent, I will just mention a few aspects because we are now talking about the ALBA, the Assembly of Popular Movements towards the ALBA, which has had moments like what Carmen mentioned, very good moments for internationalism, for construction and integration, but it has also had difficult moments. That is why it is crucial. It is extremely important for us to understand that this is an articulation of popular movements that are fighting in the government, as is happening in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, where people are the ones who are in power. We should not believe that just because there is a wave of leaders or leaderships that may occupy powerful positions in the government, we are not going to pay attention to the people's struggle. So in America, we are about to celebrate or to hold our third continental meeting. And by the way, Hernan is going to talk about that. We have had a very interesting process to establish, to determine the place where the third meeting is going to be held. And that itself is a geopolitical subject because it was supposed to be held in Bolivia, but due to the neo-fascist attack, we had to delay it and we might uh, hold it. We might hold a third meeting in, the Boli in Bolivia, but that is something that Hernan is going to talk about. So we believe that the International People's Assembly is in our horizon and is the proper pathway to strengthen our struggles. What you have there is a photograph of the closing ceremony of the International People's Assembly that was held in February 2019 in Venezuela. The International People's Assembly has four pillars. The assembly itself as an articulation process, but also there's a fundamental aspect I must mention because we need to strengthen the youth and the assembly has a fundamental role in the Che Guevara movement. We've held, we have had three chapters. This year, as well as the Brigade of the UNAM University, this year in 2020, at the beginning of 2020, we were able to make the Che Guevara International Brigade. Brigade. We had the third edition with uh, people who came from North America, from the United States, from the popular movements. We had the first international brigade that was just before the meeting of the International People's Assembly. 200 we had the presence of 200. That gave uh, a the character of a strategic element to the meeting in 2019. There's a second pillar the uh, formation training schools. And this is part of uh, the training uh, courses of the International People's Assembly that attend schools. And uh, Hernan and uh, members of the other schools will have been presenting uh, seminars here. We have uh, Fernandez in Brazil, Martin Luther King in Cuba, Marianne Esculis Argentina, Madame Bandari in Nepal, Amilcar Cabral, Juan Nkrumah, 
and Tunisia in Africa and in the north of Maghreb, the European School, the P People's Education Project in the US and the Robinsonian School in Venezuela. Resulting from the Francisco de Miranda Front I belong to, they hosted the international force and the anti-blockade popular platform of Venezuela attended and the ALBA movement in Venezuela. Also, the communication process with the people dispatch heading, but with Brazil de Fato, ALBA TV, and many other nodes of communication. And this is essential. Communication is of the essence because the battle of the idea is key in this process of interconnection of this assembly. And uh, we, will know, we all know about the hybrid warfare and the effect of the fake news and the impossibility to have access to timely and truthful information for the construction of people's power and the research effort with the three continental institutes and in the International People's Assembly, everything is liberating. To participate in the search processes where the liberal hegemon makes you believe that it's only for the experts, uh, for the academic, for the scholars, uh, and the peasants, the workers, women, uh, in students are not intellectuals. No, in the, the battle of ideas of the Tea Continental Institute is a major effort to empower the population as a whole. Perhaps you can see here, this is one of the dossier so we're going to send you a link of the dossiers of the notebooks of the Czech Continental Institute there you have bulletins Let's move forward. A wonderful picture of the closing of the ceremony in 2017. All the struggles are, are our own struggles. They come right from Haiti at the end of the closing of the assembly. And in closing, we have the celebration of the anti-imperialist uh, day. So the idea is that uh, not only, and let's move forward to the next, uh, Slide. Well, Hernan is sharing the, the three continental link in this slide. Well, this is an effort made by the assembly in progress, an anti imperialist uh, day to denounce the effect of imperialism in our lives. It's part of the agitation, mobilization, which are essential to our mobilization. There was uh, a, con a contest of uh, posts and posters to the pedagogical mobilizing in our countries posters translating the solidarity with all the aspects of uh, capitalism, neoliberalism, and hybrid warfare, especially hybrid warfare 
topic for the anti-imperialist uh, day to create posters and there we see the functioning of the hybrid wars the use of conventional and non-conventional methods to affect our daily lives and uh, the, the presence of state and non-state actors so here we see poster of capitalism the first series and how corporations own most of things we had uh, drawers, militants, and muralists of the five continents. The next slide is with the participation of uh, the various uh, colleagues, the Malaysia Socialist Communist Party. Can you really choose? Freedom to choose, privatization, deregulation, the outsourcing, the uberization, deregulation. So here in this poster, workers are more deprived of uh, guaranteed and rights. And how today in the world we have more unemployed than employed and how they are exploited the active workers let's see the next i'm about to finish work hard and uh, enjoy work and party hard the uh, what the capitalism offers is uh, drugs is a destructive way of life to agree on principles, to agree on a political platform. Let's move forward. So here, this is from Venezuela. What are you waiting for? To visualize hybrid war. how this hybrid warfare operate, summarizing this poster, conventional and non-conventional media, super exploitation in the fields of ideas, economic aspects, cultural aspects, and the poster, it's an invitation. What are you waiting for to realize that we are united by the conditions of exploitation and super exploitation what you're expecting for to unite to join this uh, unitary effort and next we see the serious organic crisis our impoverished young people are affected our anti patriarchal assembly here we denounce a new approach to popular feminism it is a a, a, a trick and uh, here we see lucileia da silva how guilty rape the fake rape that women are responsible for being raped it is because 
of women that they are raped. So, colleagues, we have a last poster to share. As Bolivar and Chavez always taught us, is beauty and revolution, the ethical and the aesthetic. It's, it's a, from European, from European on Cuba. They criticize the belonging to the European Union, but uh, in favor of the peoples, and they have been criticizing the hybrid warfare against Cuba for 60 years. Well, this is our contribution from Venezuela for this seminar. And uh, we invite you to participate, to be part of this new society that we are building. And we are uh, very happy to be able to be part of this process and to rebuild this uh, process. Thank you very much, Anna, for this wonderful presentation that is a good uh, complement to the prior talk. And it has to do with the, the possibility of uh, um, to realize a geopolitics built from the movements and from the peoples, not only related to the linking among governments, uh, multilateral organizations, but insist on the need for organized peoples. We can have a level of dispute over the type of society we want to build in the future. And in this sense, they link the International People's Assembly, unity among organizations, the popular movements, grassroots movements, to be able to challenge the uh, civilization in crisis, namely capitalism. Before starting with questions and answer, answer, I would like to complete these two talks with uh, some elements regarding the experience of the ALBA. Carmen mentioned the Bolivarian geopolitics, a multi-centric and pluripolar world from the government standpoint, but also Anna talked about the similar policy, but from the grassroots movements. So I'm going to do, I'm going to link these two approaches, the government forces and the grassroots forces. And I'm going to show a timeline of the construction of ALBA. We said that in 2004, Fidel Castro and Commander Chavez met in Havana. There, they analyzed the campaign against the FTAA, the neoliberal agenda proposed to Latin America from the US, and taking stock of the campaign to defeat these initiatives they then deem it important to build an alternative political approach. And uh, as Chavez said, after a long night of political debate with Commander Fidel, at, the, at dawn, they realized that uh, light coming is uh, sun rising, and then they think that the alternative is the dawn, is ALBA, the alternative for the peoples of the America. And that day, that year, the first summit of ALBA takes place, place in Havana to lay 
down the groundwork of ALBA. And uh, one of the elements was the spirit of cooperation among the peoples, the cooperation that go beyond the economy. It's not integration to integrate markets to global capitalism, but rather cooperation, economic, social, cultural cooperation among the peoples to build a model of development to favor the peoples of the region. So in 2005, the Summit of the Americas in Mar del Plata, Argentina takes place. And there normally the idea was to close, uh, to sign the agreement uh, uh, proposed by the US with the rest of the continent. Although proposed in 1994 in the first uh, Summit of the Americas in Miami, namely the FDAA, which is the final consolidation of the neoliberal approach in the region. To consolidate the control through the markets of our continent. Now in Mar del Plata, however, this campaign fostered by the various progressive popular grassroots left-wing parties in the continent broke the consensus that the US had built during these two decades. So in Mar del Plata, we witnessed the defeat of FTAA. There is no consensus, conditions are not, uh, not exist for this uh, project to be implemented. And in 2006, after several ALBA summits, as the cooperation treaty among the peoples, Hugo Chavez proposed that we need something which is more, more important between Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and other countries of the Caribbean. Chavez needs popular mobilization that existed in the 90s and 2000s against the neoliberal agenda, that that type of mobilization was another ingredient. That mobilization force should exist within the ALBA. And it is there that the process started. That very year, 2006, a summit between the European Union and Latin America in Peru is held. And at the same time, a, a summit of uh, grassroots movements. And there, this thesis started to be discussed, meaning to build the political project of ALBA. But everything was defined at that time. It was very sketchy. It was just an alternative. It was a, an option to neoliberalism. That very year, a summit of integration of the peoples takes place in Cochabamba, in the fringes of the meeting of the countries of the South. And the debate continues. So in the coming years, there's a constant debate of the grassroots movements answering to the Call launched by Chavez and other persons to incorporate the grassroots movement to the political proposal of ALBA. In 2007, then, a presidential summit in Venezuela, in Merida, in Tintorero, Lara State, to create a council of uh, grassroots movements of ALBA. And Chavez proposed that uh, within the ALBA as a treaty of cooperation of the peoples of the countries mentioned, well, there was a political body of coordination, a coordination among ministers of the country, but also some bodies were responsible for the economic, social, and uh, political agenda. The idea of 
service was to create in that structure a special commission of grassroots movements, a council of grassroots movements with the same importance as of the other bodies of ministerial councils and, and so on and so forth. In this fashion, we start a new phase of grassroots movement as part of integration regional schemes. So from Tintorero onwards, there is the need to create a political commission of the social movements to create uh, national chapters. So in Bolivia, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and the people in the, in the countries of the Caribbean, member countries of the ALBA scheme, there should be a body, a chapter, national chapter of the Council of Grassroots Movements. At the same time, concrete bodies should be created, like the ALBA houses, physical areas of this project. This subvert the traditional Western uh, position of uh, regarding integration processes. So there is a, a change from the, the ground up, from the bottom up. This is a summit of, uh, summit of the grassroots movement to analyze the content of this movement. And it is there that the political body starts uh, being created to defend the rights of the, of the Pachamama. The bottom-up action of the peoples, the cultural rescue, the agenda of decolonization from the bottom up, a social agenda to address what Chavez called the historic social debt with our peoples, and then the agenda of ALBA as a cooperation among the peoples, among governments, this very agenda is strengthened also at the level of the grassroots movements. In 2008, several movements responded to this continental call to discuss the ALBA as a project for the region. So Via Campesina convened organizations to debate the political principles of this process. So together with the construction on how to build a council or grassroots movement within the ALBA as part of integration process within governments at the same time, we see the progress of our discussion among grassroots movements that do not belong to the countries of the ALBA scheme, but they start to debate ALBA as a political integration process. So with this call by the Via Campesina, uh, a debate uh, is triggered in 2009 within the World uh, Forum the, the charter of Domingo de Pará is uh, written, the social movements, they rescue the horizon of ALBA and they propose the basic elements of this uh, integration process. They propose a process based on the, in the solidarity, a new economic framework reflecting the strengthening of the social conditions of the majority, the rescue of cultural diversity of our peoples against the neoliberal agenda, the global capitalist agenda, and all the systems of domination within this capitalism, capitalist agenda. And then formally, 
there is the invitation from organization of the region, the, uh, such as the landless movement in Brazil, several social movements uh, in Cuba, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina. They raised the flags to call for the construction of a, a ALBA from the grassroots movement. So we, the progressive government uh, that raised the ALBA flag, at the same time, the rest of the countries, of the 25 countries, we need in the need to foster ALBA as an alternative uh, project. In this simultaneous process, a summit of social movements of ALBA, together with the summit of presidents of ALBA TCP, TCP in 2009, in order to strengthen that level of linking in 2010-2011, national chapters are built of the social movements of ALBA. And in 2013, in the National School of Rica Hernandez, the first continental um, Congress of uh, ALBA movements is uh, organized, is held. And uh, then we start building the basis the groundwork, and we're going to give you a page of ALBA movements when you find some foundational documents of this process. And national chapters of ALBA movement in 25 uh, countries of the region. And then we have the operational secretariat, coordinating communication, training, linking, linkages of this uh, organic movement. In 2016, in Colombia, the second uh, continental movement take place with uh, some chapters. It was discussed which would have to be the program that had to drive the movements. In that case, I would like to make a parenthesis because now that I was listening to Anna, she was mentioning how in 2015 there was a conference called Dilemma of Humanity in the Fernandez School. And if I'm not mistaken, this was one of the issues, one of the points in this Continental Assemblies of ALBA movements. Right in that seminar, Anna, I think that we met in that uh, seminar with the, the two, with she, seems Sue, etc. Then in 2016, in the second continental meeting, after constructing that organic system, we built the program, the fighting program of the social movements for the reinforcement of ALBA. So we proposed a program that contains six central axes that are common to the different organizations and movements of the continent. On the one hand, the drive of the solidary internationalism of the people from the grassroots, a second axis that has to do with the cultural battle and the decolonization that also has to do with the battle against the patriarchal colonial capitalist uh, battles, etc. The third axis has to do with the fight for motherland, for the Pachamama, the fight to revert the eviction of our continent through different stage of contractions, the extraction of value, the waged work, the unwaged work, the logistics, but also the dispossession of the motherland, the mining, different operations of the continent that have been the central axis of fight and mobilization. Next, we have a fourth axis that has to do with the democratization and construction of the popular power. The certainty that we cannot build an alternative project without full democracy, without real democracy. Not only the bourgeoisie democracy, we must build a grassroots democracy where the popular power is a central vehicle. 
A fifth axis has to do with the construction of an economical model for the good living that has nothing to do with the, the offices of the economical development. It has to do with the construction of the economy that doesn't only think about the circulation of capital and that doesn't think that only from the production and accumulation of capital, we can think about the development of nations. No, it is a logic where the horizons of the economy must be centered in the construction and the reconstruction, not only of life, but also on one specific mode of life. And there we rescue the notion of the good living. This is a notion that comes from indigenous people, what is called the summa causae y summa caumano, which takes into consideration the good living as a way of life that rescues the permanent recreation with life or taking life from a community point of view. A sixth axis has to do with popular feminism. It's a new project of society that has to do with the patriarchation of society, with the construction of new relationships that are not based on the domination of gender. It is the reconstruction of new political and economical thesis from feminism, from grassroots, from the grassroots basis. So with this, I would like to close my presentation by that proposal from the ALBA, that the ALBA proposal has had two levels that have been articulated in time. One level that has to do with the alliance with the leftist governments, progressive governments, and the nexus that has to do with the articulation with social movements and popular forces. I believe that along that pathway, it is important to rescue the fact that we are giving shape to many concepts, many concepts, many political theses. For example, I would like to mention what Jade mentioned at the beginning of this session that had to do with the thesis of Professor Samir Amin that has to do with the, the disvinculation of the matrix of reproduction of civilization and capitalism. And I think that in the case of ALBA, the goal is the unification of people to be able to disvinculate from this capitalist model. And we've given shape to concepts that we believe are important and that must be discussed, such as the diplomacy of the people. The idea of Fidel Castro and of Hugo Chavez of having a world without imperialism, a world without a centralized hegemony, a world where there are different centers of power and of articulation with different poles of articulation must be built not only based on the unity of governments, it is also built based on the diplomacy of people considering uh, assumptions uh, that uh, consider integration uh, systems where the cooperation agenda between people enable us to build synthesis with the popular movements that are the central subject of fights in this society that is in crisis. These are the masses that were mobilized in the United States against the climax process after the murder of George Floyd in a society that is deeply racist, strongly racist, but the same thing happened in France with a mobilization of the Yellow Vests movement. The same thing we saw in Africa with the mobilization against the movements of neoliberal adjustments, genocides, looting, Looting is a central element of demobilization of our people. We've seen that in the South Global. We've seen it in Peru recently, in Ecuador last year. We've seen it recently in Guatemala. Last year, we saw a Chile in crisis with a mobilization. Also in Colombia, there was a mobilization against a neoliberal and genocide agenda driven by the revolution. And of course, the people from Haiti that has been permanently fighting against a historical apparatus, like what Carmen mentioned, a looting process, a dispossession process, and our people have been fighting against that. 
So I just wanted to rescue some of those elements. And next, I would like to make some sort of a general overview and to mention the questions that we have received through the different platforms. I believe that Jade can read the questions that were posed to, through the streaming in China, and here I can read the questions that were posed through Zoom. Jade, Jade, could you please read the questions that you received that you have received? Yes, uh, uh, we have uh, two main questions, and the first one, um, because of the U.S. sanction and the pandemic, uh, how uh, Venezuela government continue to uh, carry out the integration of Latin America through oil diplomacy, such as. Uh, uh, Venezuela oil exchange for uh, Cuban medical service in uh, previous years. This is the first question. The second question is about, um, we have heard of the experiment of Bank of the South. And uh, any uh, uh, experiment, the current experiment uh, from the government or from the grassroots, because I think uh, it is very uh, important uh, to um, do some kind of financial integration through the um, the creation of the Bank of the South. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jade, for your questions. Next, I'm going to read very quickly some of the questions that we have through Zoom. On one hand, they asked, when Bolivar was 12 years old, there was an armed insurgence of Jose Leonardo Chirinos and Simon Rodriguez was his professor. However, there were more than 54 rebellions against the Spanish Empire. That question was for Carmen, but we'll make it general. Do you think that this affected somehow the fundamental role of the liberator on the independence and on the formation of Venezuelanism? Do you think that the geopolitical view of Venezuela is fed from the historical future? And what is the role of the Afro and indigenous social movements in the multipolar world from the revolutionary pan Africanism, taking into account that Chavez mentioned that in Africa and Latin America, we have uh, the equilibrium axis. Another question, what should be changed in our embassies? Yeah. I believe that person is referring to the Venezuelan embassies as a in political instrument to drive the diplomacy of peoples, the soft diplomacy to continue along the pathway of the emancipation of our foreign policies. Congratulations to the speakers. Another question, is it possible to call through the IAP a Pan-African meeting with the goal to unify our forces in the world against racism and discrimination within the framework of the repairs of slavery and colonialism? Another question, how can we win the head and the heart of the majority if our project of alternative society is humanistic, transformative, and does not count with the popular support it should count with. Congratulations to Anna. This is for Hernan, and we can make it general. Within the framework of the people's diplomacy and considering that in Latin America and in the Caribbean, there are more than 200 Afro-descendants, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Haiti, among others, from ALBA movements, have you considered to, to include the Afro-descendant struggle in your program agenda? Your presentations have been quite uh, inspiring. Well, I think that's what we had. Uh, from YouTube, we have greetings for Anna and for Carmen. Well, so with these questions, which are a few, let us try to close up, wrap up, and maybe in a period of 15 minutes, we might try to answer these questions that we got from the different participants. 
Let us begin in the same order. First, Carmen, then we will have Anna, and in the end, I will be the last one. Well, once again, hello. Regarding the question that has to do with the independence war, the pre-independence war, if it had a fundamental role in the liberator and in his geopolitical view, I believe that the question is yes, totally yes. We said that the geographic position of Venezuela, which represents the door to the Caribbean, it is like a Caribbean profile with a very good important port. That position is not only vital, but also Venezuela was the safe place for vessels to arrive vessels with persons coming from all over the world, not only with slaves that had in their nations cultures and positions about the world from all sorts. They had different idea from religious idea, political ideas, etc there is evidence that this did happen in our Venezuela. Besides the fact that we are the door to the Caribbean, you know that our indigenous people were navigators and many of them came from the Amazonas. They crossed the continent through the, up to they got to the Caribbean, taking ideas and organization forms the person who made the question asked about Simon Rodriguez, who was the inspiring person for Bolivar. And by that time, he already had a new topic, socialism, and early ideas that would support the paradigm and the grassroots idea of our libertarian process and our geopolitical vision. So definitely, yes, the answer is yes. Besides, not only our independence war, but we were also immersed in this continent where we had the first independence war. We had the first Black Republic of Haiti. And Haiti was and will be fundamental for the geopolitical concession of Venezuela. Without its help, without its ideas and weapons, we would not have at this moment, the Bolivarian Republic. So it is quite clear that my answer is a definite yes. Regarding the future, we have talked about the Venezuelan process, which is fed from the Bolivarian ideas. The Bolivarian ideas have uh, an ample and diverse conception. Bolivar built a reasoning that includes illustration, but not only illustration, but also the European ideals. The European ideals and the Caribbean ideals at that time. I hope that I answered the question. We have another question that has to do with the importance of integration through the petroleum diplomacy. Let me explain to you. At this moment, Venezuela has unilateral sanctions, coercitive sanctions, where they have tried to prevent Venezuela from using its uh, resources, its uh, power resources, etc. If it hadn't been for the help, assistance, and uh, support, firm support of countries like China and Iran, who have sent oil vessels and who have been responding, or who have not uh, been subdued to the imperial threats, if it hadn't been for them, Venezuela, would, Venezuela wouldn't have fuel and we would not be reactivating our oil industry. Not only the oil industry, 
but also the pivot of our geopolitics. Since this is a country with the oil resources, this will last for a long time. So it is crucial to have an oil industry that is independent. And this is done with the help of this country's Iran that has supplied fuel and that has also supplied new technologies and has helped us build our refineries. They have helped us create a more sovereign industry, less independent from the US industry. We created the Venezuelan refinery based on its image and its necessities as such. It is necessary indeed, and it is not a deficit because it's a process that already began with Chavez and with important projects. This has to do with the financial integration, the integration of our markets, the intensification of the doctrine of the South-South cooperation and complementarity. This is a process that is right now in standby. Nevertheless, it has lots of possibilities of being reactivated with countries that are reactivating their sovereign and nationalist systems with the rescue of democracy in Bolivia, with the rescue of progressist governments in Argentina, with all the possibilities that we have in our countries like Ecuador, Peru. And well, I believe that the fact that we have people who are clear and who are 100% willing to be well positioned in order to strengthen their sovereignty and the use of their resources is quite important. And also to make use of what is called the popular power as such. The soft diplomacy, the people's diplomacy is a Bolivarian doctrine. With Chavez, we started a new diplomatic paradigm and people have the right to exercise their rights there. Venezuela, with the government of President Chavez, by the way, this was the first government that signed a cooperation agreement with a social movement. This agreement is known by everyone is the Tartar agreement that was signed in Brazil with Via Campesina and that has given rise to what we have today. It is a diplomatic milestone that should be studied. I believe that our embassy, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have studied this. They will study the systematization of this new diplomatic manner because it is not an isolated fact. It is a fact that will be intensified because people know that they hold power and an exercise of power has to do with diplomacy and international relationships. These were my answers. I hope that I was able to contribute with this seminar. It was an honor for me to be here with you. I will continue following you. And I hope that next year we can continue with this academic meetings that are so necessary. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much, Carmen, for your participation. And thank you for the central importance and the support of the Simon Bolivar Institute. As an organizer of this activity and being a very young institution, you are already driving a strong debate agenda with people that have lately gathered an important number of uh, activists and militants of the South Global Growth from Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and even North America. Let us now give the floor to Ana Maldonado, our dear comrade from the Francisco de Miranda Front and from the International People's Assembly. Well, 
it is extraordinary the fact that I am able to participate in this meeting. All the presentations were excellent. There was a question that has to do with how to represent and how to strengthen and intensify the representation of our missions and embassies in the world with posters to make that people's diplomacy more effective. By the way, we were greeted by an extraordinary ambassador, Carol, Carol Delgado from Ecuador. She is known for being a spokesperson for the people who are struggling in Ecuador. She was expelled by traitor Lenin Moreno, who came after Rafael Correa and treasoned all the principles. Carol Delgado in Ecuador was the re Venezuelan representative in the Republic of Ecuador. And she continued working on that for a long time. The attention of our fellow Venezuelan citizens in Ecuador supported all that process that had to do with the victims of the warfare that, in, in, that tried to, to attack our population and try to save them from the lootings and from the financial asphyxiation and economical suffocation. You can see that the interaction of the cores gives response to many of the things that you were mentioning. One of the things that Commander Chavez taught us And even in the text of a believer, the text that Carmen mentioned in her presentation, in many of the texts of a believer and in the letters that Bolivar exchanged with all the revolutionary conspirators in the war for independence, he, realize, he realized how there were some messengers who had the task of taking like a little bag with gold to try to support the independent warfare that was not easy. Napoleon Bonaparte stated that the armies walk on their stomachs, but our independent armies walked without shoes, without clothes, with empty stomachs, and they fought to achieve the independence of Venezuela. There were women who were disguised as men. And uh, when Bolivar mentioned the list, uh, he, he didn't identify them as women. And later on, the archaeologist identified that those corpses belonged to women who participated in that independence war. So what did we learn with Bolivar and with Chavez? I must say to our comrades, because the one who proposes offers as well. So those who are proposing a Pan-African Congress in order to talk about all these processes and how to visualize the anti-racist movements all around the world. We have learned that solidarity is a responsibility and not a gift. Responsibility is done in times of bonanza in times of a favorable economical correlation, because right now we are having a, a, an organic crisis from a capitalist point of view. We are going to have a sustainable decrease in production and in all economical factors. So in that change of model that we are proposing, must try to establish real formulas for that independence to be permanent in order for us to be able to 
make firm those independence that are people need. But I insist on the central aspect. Solidarity is a responsibility. This is taught by our friends from Africa, from Cuba. I sent to Pablo and Hernan a picture of a doctor from the La Vega Parish in Caracas. Her name is Saive Moreno. She's a doctor. And based on the reciprocity agreements, that were mentioned by Hernan. Cuba indicates or states that they must uh, perform economical complex uh, processes where there is a complementarity agreement. And our friends from Cuba who come here from the beginnings of the revolution to offer their services their professional services or their missions here in the country can be able to form part of a new economy. So solidarity is a responsibility. It is not a gift. It is done based on objective conditions with the conditions that we have available, but conditions that must be firm with a revolutionary concept. That is the doctor. She's from the La Vega Parish. That was, picture was taken when we did an epidemiolo epidemiological operation to restrain a contagion focus. She has a mask where you can see some characters in Chinese. I don't know what it says, but I do know that it formed part with the aerial bridge that we established with China, a maritime bridge with Iran, an aerial bridge with China. <laughs> we can see what they were texting, what Hernan is texting. Well, so that's what solidarity is. And uh, the right wing that we have had here from the beginning of the revolution has always had the discourse or the speech. They've always said that our oil is being given away and that their purpose when they resume power, and that is not going to happen by the way, is that they're going to stop giving away the oil to other countries such as Cuba. That is their narration regarding Cuba, regarding our relationship with Cuba. Do you know what the poor people of our slum feel? People who stopped dying from diseases when Cubans arrived here, do you know what they feel? They feel hatred for that fascist ideology and they do have extraordinary arguments to strengthen their conviction. So I believe that we must continue with our system of communalizing the external service. International relationships are on a very good path, but we must continue to work on that. They're telling me that the Chinese characters on the mask say, mask, <laughs> medical mask, that's what it says. What we do have clear is that that is a beautiful picture of a woman who's young, who's poor, who would have never been able to study medicine. She graduated in Cuba. She's using biosafety material from China. She didn't go and practice medicine in another country. No, she stayed here in the country resisting. And I believe that that is the strength and the model that the empire fe fears in the US. They fear the fact that we are able to exterminate the neoliberal hegemony and that we are on the right pathway and that we will win. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. It's been 
a privilege. These 10 weeks have been a privilege for the dialogue with the various activists, intellectuals, fighters of the Bolivarian Revolution. And today has been a wonderful closing. I just want to contribute a few elements for final, finally closing this session. And comments. regarding the, the questions of the participants. The capacity to strengthen the petroleum solidarity, the history of the Caribbean has been a history of colonialism and the systematic looting in a very difficult situation of colonial dependence and material dependence. Some Caribbean islands remain colonial dependence. Colonial, colonial dependent, uh, de dependent from European nations. And they still have this control regime. Others have a a control system which is not explicit, but uh, it's uh, another type of control. Like in Haiti, that through military control, they dominate the Haitian people. The solidarity built from Venezuela with the concrete support to the Caribbean nations, this has been an example of a reciprocal relations because Venezuela has made huge effort to share economic and energy resources to try to mitigate the effect of neocolonialism in the Caribbean. Well, the Caribbean nations also have expressed in a concrete fashion their concrete solidarity and the struggle with Venezuela, um, starting with Cuba, but also in the case of Haiti and Haiti also among many teachings. Haiti, by the way, was the first uh, nation to fight against uh, colonialism and to fight for its liberation. But from this historical struggle process, Haiti taught us a lesson, namely that uh, to be Haitian for them has to do with all those who fight for liberty and against slavery. For them, that's a definition of the definition of Dessaline of uh, what is to be Haitian. Haitian national is the one fighting slavery and fighting dominance. So all of us there, therefore, in the global south, we should vindicate ourselves as Haitians. The blockade has been attacking not only Venezuela, but the possibility of the Caribbean nations to defend themselves against their neo neo-colonial logic. As Venezuela is prevented from helping the Caribbean, well, they are attacking the Caribbean and uh, preventing them from receiving assistance from the Venezuela. In the case of the US, they proposed the deployment of a US fleet in the Caribbean with the excuse to stop drug trafficking. It has to do really um, with the possibility to stop the assistance of Venezuela towards the Caribbean. And as a militant, despite we cannot say it out loud because it's part of this struggle against imperialism, but I'm sure that every time there is a vessel from Iran or we can, uh, we can uh, export uh, um, oil, some of them could go to Cuba and other vessels will go to the Caribbean to continue assisting the Caribbean nations despite the US blockade. 
So one third of the country that expressed itself during the elections, we support that uh, it makes much sense to share our oil with the peoples of the Caribbean than sharing the oil with the empire. So we are in favor of that uh, export of oil towards the Caribbean. This is a challenge. We need to strengthen the, the financial integration processes. We need to go back to the Bank of the South. It's a need for the peoples, not only Latin America and the Caribbean, but this, the, in the global South, because from the outset, Michael Hudson was mentioned when he's been denouncing the weight of dollarization as uh, one of the main tools of uh, the imperialist uh, dominance, the transfer of the, the debt, the debt to the countries of the global south, the control of the process of uh, foreign trade. One of, in one of the conference in 1975, in a seminar, I heard this. The United States posed as a con as a condition that no operation can be conducted in the hemisphere without the dollar. I mentioned this because we cannot talk about sovereignty regionally and locally if we do not replace the dollar as a, a, a currency for exchange. But also, if we could not create a new scheme for trade, ALBA TCP is based on a principle, not integration from neoliberalism or economic integration, but also this integration cannot be a neoliberal economic integration, but it has to be an economic uh, integration still through the Sucre in regional exchange connected with all other emerging nations such as China, Iran, Russia. The, the linking mentioned by Samir Amin has to do with uh, give life to those tools. And uh, regarding the Afro element, in the case of Alma movement, I'm going to share the link of uh, Alba movement. In its definition, it is uh, a linkage of 400 movements of 25 uh, continents, uh, countries of the continent uh, who are anti-imperialist, capitalist, uh, anti-patriarchal, feminist, uh, and eco-socialist, but also they, their horizon is the construction of socialism but not any type of socialism. It has to be an Indo, in Afro and our American socialism built from our key identities. And beyond that declaration, I'd like to add that there are two key elements that we need to rescue from the Afro peoples, which is our struggle as well. One, the power of uh, the idea of uh, reparations against central nations. The colleagues of the Caribbean, they have raised the flag that, as Fidel Castro said, in one of the summits in 58, I think, he's Post that Latin American and Caribbean nations cannot pay the debt, but we should not pay the debt. And on top of that, we do not want to pay the international debt. International debts, according to them, are incoherent. We cannot, and we should not, and we, can, we do not want to pay them. And these debts, should be cancelled. And they say that we need reparation. Not only we do not owe them nothing, they owe us everything. 
So we need to raise, raise the ideas of the Afro decade and the reparations flags. These flags have been already raised by the Afro movements, but uh, they also belong to our continent as a whole. And that's uh, a, a struggle that we need to conduct. And uh, regarding the construction of an alternative, if there is something that uh, has helped us to tackle the pandemic, is that the pandemic has uh, accelerated the crisis of uh, capitalism and the civilizational role of capitalism. So we need to build alternatives. And the Afro countries have been proposing the idea to rescue the communal way of life. And community has been a key element in these seminars. And we need to rescue that ideas. And the maroon peoples, the Afro people fought for independence from Europe, but also built alternative ways of life that existed already in our countries before the genocide from Europe 500 years ago. So we need to relink with those ways of life. They were not completely erased. We still find traces in the Pacific, Colombian Pacific, in the Western and Eastern Caribbean. There are still traces of that in Bolivia, in the southern part of our community, in the Garifuna communities, all over the continent we find traces and we need to relink with those communal bases that have enabled us to survive. And Micharmes from Haiti always says that we need to relink with a Caribbean civilization with a way of life very concrete that has enabled them to persist at the, the height of the capitalist crisis and the height of colonial attacks from central powers. We need to relink with those traditional civilizational ways. Well, with these comments, I would like again to thank our panelists today. I would like to thank for this first cycle of this international seminar. We need to make effort to disseminate even further the content of these seminars to those who have not been able to follow the different sessions. To, if you want to know about Venezuela, you need to listen to the main actors of this country, those who are daily building the Bolivarian Revolution. Next year, we will continue approaching the construction of the Bolivarian Revolution, not only from the communalist perspective, but uh, the communal movement as a, a process. We're going to listen to activists who have, are going to discuss the historical construction, the historical resistance, not only during the independence, but prior to the independence, the maroon construction, the basis of communal processes in Venezuela as, as historical processes with Roberto Duque, Iraida Barquet, Mario Sanoja, but also we will be able to see the um, achievements of the Bolivar Revolution, to study the concrete effects of the blockade during these seven years. But also we will be able to cover the process of uh, alternative uh, economic constructions what have been the main challenges of the struggle against uh, a process of global accumulation that uh, have uh, given Venezuela the role of provider of uh, value, natural value, and from the Venezuelan rentierism, uh, they have uh, fostered uh, accumulation. So that's the challenge for next year. We're going to share this year's sessions but we're going to prepare the coming sessions. There will be a book published both in Mandarin and Spanish and English. 
So that's a joint challenge that we have with our dear brothers and sisters of the University of Lignam and the Global uh, Sustainability University. And thank you very much, uh, Kim Chilao, Chamei, all the team of translation that have supported uh, our interpreters from Venezuela and China. I, however, I want uh, that Tishwe to do the closing of this. Uh, Jade, you have the uh, floor to formally close this last session of this year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Hanan. Um, on, behalf, on behalf of the Global University for Sustainability, we would like to thank the interpreters from Venezuela, Maria, Claudia, Alisa, and Camilo, and Chinese interpreters, uh, Huang Xiaomei, Liang Ying, Yang Xiangruo. And we would like to thank a uh, designer from Utopix and uh, Ting Ting from um, China. Uh, we also thank the whole team in Venezuela and China. And uh, particularly, we thank uh, Green Grant uh, Eco Tech Center for doing the live streaming. And we, now we have uh, almost uh, 2,000 uh, followers. And uh, uh, the next uh, uh, Venezuela's uh, lecture series uh, will start from the uh, second week in uh, January 2021. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, listening and also patience. And see you next year. Thank you very much. Mucho Thank gracias. You yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Greetings to all of you. Bye bye. See you next year. Commune or nothing. We will live and we will overcome. Thank you.